This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Novelist Catherine Clark on this edition of Conversations. Catherine Clark established her writing credentials co-authoring two oral biographies, Milking the Moon, a Southerner's Story of Life on This Planet with Eugene Walter, and Mother Wit, an Alabama midwife story with Oni Lee Logan. But writing fiction is a whole other challenge. However, for Clark, it has been a successful endeavor. Her debut novel, The Headmaster's Darlings, caught the attention of best-selling author Pat Conroy. He was instrumental in getting the book published and wrote the foreword. Clark and Conroy, uh, Conroy recently completed his oral biography. Catherine is a former college professor and has an undergraduate degree from Harvard and a PhD from Emory. We welcome Catherine Clark to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I'm curious, how did you make the transition from college prof uh, professor to full-time writer? I made it very happily. <laughs> <laughs> I'd always wanted to be a full-time writer, but I knew I needed to support myself, so that's why I got the PhD in the first place. So for many years, I tried to do both and found that it was almost impossible because teaching is like being a parent. Yeah. It just takes all your energy, all your love, all your intelligence, everything you can give it needs. Uh, and while I was teaching, it was much easier for me to do books like the two oral biographies I did before my first novel. Right. And it was when I was no longer teaching that I was finally able to devote myself full time to writing and get that first novel finished. Tell me about the oral biographies you did. Um, and, and let me get you to explain first, what is an oral biography? Okay. An oral biography is a book, and this is my definition, okay. that no one has written. Okay. It involves getting an individual's spoken words down on paper. So what I have done in those two projects, actually it's three now with the book with Pat Conroy, I recorded these three individuals and got their life stories down on tape in their own words. I got the, the recordings transcribed. So I had pages and pages and pages of transcripts. And I took those transcripts and edited them into the narrative of the individual's life. And the way I got into it, Jeff, is I was told about a black woman in Mobile, Alabama, who was working as a maid for a family that my cousin married into. Okay. And during his visits to his in-laws, he would talk to this maid, Oni Lee Logan, and she told him about her work as a midwife and told him actually that her work as a maid was in support of her work as a midwife, sort of like my work as a college professor was in support of my career as a writer. And uh, she wanted to write a book about her experiences as a midwife, but she didn't know how to write. My cousin contacted me to see if I could help her. And I met her and I, she, she was just a natural born storyteller. Wow. And I knew that what the book really needed was her voice, not just her stories and her life, but her stories and her life in her own voice. Wow. So I recorded her. And, and it, I'll never forget the day that the actual book came out. I was still living in Mobile at the time. Right. And I took the book over to her house and I gave her her copy. And she opened it up and sort of rifled through the pages, and then she handed it back to me and said, read some of it to me, baby. Mm. And so I, I just picked up a, a passage, and she leaned back in her chair, and she said, that ain't nothing but my own words. And, and I, mm -hmm. I said, I, I know, Oni, I thought I told you I, that's how I was going to do the book. And she said, the whole book? 
is like that? The whole book is nothing but my words? I said, that's right. And then <laughs> she said, thank you, baby. And then she looked up at the ceiling and she said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> wow. And that, that's one of the best moments of my life. I can imagine. I can imagine. And what, what, what did you learn from her? What did I not learn from her? She used to call me, she, she used to say, you got education stacked up to here, like she was doing books. And she said, but, but you don't know nothing, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and she used to say, you're so young and stupid, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> she was just one of those people full of wisdom, full of, of, of life wisdom. She, she knew everything about birth and death and everything in between. I mean, she, she was just a remarkable soul. Is she still alive? No, no, she's not. When we recorded, she was in her 70s, and she never knew exactly when her birthday was. Wow. So she was, um, she was quite elderly by the time the book came out. So. I'm curious about the second one with Eugene Walter. What was that like? And, and, and first of all, for people who don't know, kind of explain who he is. The best way to explain Eugene Walter is to compare him to Truman Capote. And they were actually contemporaries as well as friends. Uh, Truman used to come down from Monroeville to Mobile every Saturday to go to the movies. Okay. They were part of a, a, a club that went to the movies together on Saturday. So they knew each other and they were very, very like each other. In fact, Gore Vidal called, I wrote Gore Vidal a letter uh, when I was doing the book with Eugene. He wrote me back and he said, um, Eugene Walter, the other Capote, the good one. <laughs> 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 lied only to entertain other people. <laughs> Truman Capote lied to hurt other people. Wow. And that was, that was his comparison. That was his way of understanding Eugene. And I think, I think it's a good one. But Eugene did not write anything that you will ever have heard of. Uh, he was just, he was a bon vivant. And he was in the right place at the right time. He was in New York in the 40s after the war. He was in Paris in the 50s, where George Plimpton was founding mm -hmm. the Paris Review, mm -hmm. and Eugene became a part of that. Oh, wow. Then he was in Rome in the 60s and became part of the Italian film scene. He was in Fellini's Eight and a Half and in several other Italian movies. And he just has the most wonderful stories about his experiences in all of those places. He met so many famous people, and he entertained. He loved entertaining hosting dinner parties. So he's got great stories. He lived a great life, and he's a great raconteur. And the way I got into to taping his life story is he was in Mobile at the time that Mother Wick came out, and he said, darling, now you've got to do your next one. And I said, no, Eugene, I, I need to write my novels. I, I, th that was a one-time thing because Oni couldn't write. Oh, no, 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 darling. This was such a success. You've got to do another one. Finally, I figured out he wanted me to do him. We had all assumed that Eugene would write his own memoirs because he did write a couple of novels and he was a writer. But then I realized he spent a little too much time with Dr. Jim Bean every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, putting Jim Bean aside and writing was no longer in the cards for him. And it made sense to tape him as well because he was a better raconteur than he was a writer. He was such an entertainer, such a great storyteller, and he needed an audience. He needed a live audience to really turn himself on. So what were the days like when you would go interview him? Well, I actually, Jeff, thought it was not, I thought it was going to be catch as catch can and that I'd have to be running behind him and tagging along to parties. And I was surprised when he um, asked for business hours. He wanted me to arrive at his house at 9 a.m. starting Monday morning. I'd never known Eugene Walter to keep business hours in his life. So I, that's what I did. I showed up at 9 every morning, 
and I was um, escorted into his cat-free room. Cat-free room. Cat-free room, where all his relics from his life in New York, Paris, and Rome were in there. The cat, he had about seven mangy, flea-ridden cats, and they were not allowed to go into this room. <laughs> 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 and it, it ha also had all his books, all his, all his treasures. So um, we usually interviewed for two and a half hours, and he was sober. He was stone cold sober when I got there, which is a, was another surprise. I'd never been around Eugene when he was sober. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he could be sober. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I, I was actually a little worried at first because Eugene was the kind of storyteller I thought who needed to be a little bit lubricated <laughs> <laughs> before he could yeah. really yeah. be himself, be right. fully himself. But um, no, he he was great, but about 11.30 he started really needing me to get out of the house so that he could confer with Jim Bean. So. <laughs> <laughs> So I had about two and a half to three hours every day with him, and then I got kicked out. Wow. I'm curious, how do you prepare for something like that? To you know, I mean, I know what I do is I get ready to do an interview, but you're talking about doing something that's going to be lasting for hours upon hours and days upon days. How do you prepare yourself for that? Well, with with the midwife, I had to do a lot of research about midwifery in Alabama, mm -hmm. and. With Eugene, I did research on the on New York in the 40s, Paris in the 50s, and Rome in the 60s. I researched the Italian film era. Uh, I researched the Paris Review. So I had, I think, I hope, enough depth, enough background to come up with some good questions. But here's the thing, with a great raconteur, you don't need great questions. They are such skilled storytellers that all it takes is the merest suggestion of mm -hmm. a topic and they're off and running. And if they're not, you don't have a good subject for an oral biography. And that, that's, that's my philosophy, that's my perspective. And then I'm assuming the challenge becomes the editing part then. The right? challenge yeah. is the editing part, exactly. What, yeah. to, what to put in, what to leave out, and how to shape it. Tell me about your first novel, uh, Headmaster's Darlings, and it was sort of uh, based upon a teacher of yours, correct? Yes, Norman, yes. Norman Hayne? Martin Hayne. I'm sorry, He's, Martin a, he's Norman sorry. Laney in the, in, the, in the novel. Well, actually, Jeff, you could call my first novel a failed oral biography because I initially wanted to do an oral biography with Martin Haynes. When I, after I did the one with Eugene Walter, somebody said, you need to do this with Martin Haynes. He was just as much a character, larger than life, over the top, just as much a raconteur. Mm -hmm. To me, he had just as fascinating a life story because he came from blue collar Alabama and made it to the top of Mountain Brook society right. <laughs> as a fat man weighing hundreds of pounds. Yeah. Um, and so my, my first thought was to do an oral biography with him. And I, unfortunately, he passed away before we could even really discuss that. And I think what happened is the idea of doing a book about him never left my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I had to remind myself that I was always planning to write fiction anyway. Right. And this was life telling me it's time to get that first novel going. And this is your character. And it was, he was a great character for a first time novelist because he was all there. He was so complex and so fascinating that I didn't feel like I needed to make anything up. Right. There was just so much to work with. And What was the transition for you as a writer like though, going into that, that fiction for the first time? Was it difficult? It, it actually is. The first one, by far, was the hardest. Right. Well, with oral biography, Jeff, you're given all of your material. Right. You're given all your characters. You're given your voice. 
You're given your themes. You're, you're given everything except the structure. And that's what I had to step in and do as an editor. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with fiction, you're given nothing. You've got to pull it all out of your head. And that's why I say it was great to have this uh, Martin Hames character that I could, that was a given in a way. Right, right. But everything else is something I had to come up with. What's that process like? Is that something you sit down at your computer and just say, okay, I'm going to, from, you know, nine in the morning to four in the afternoon, I'm going to do it? Or is it something that you run around throughout the day and you're thinking of ideas and character development and whatnot? It's both. I had to start treating it like a, a full-time job and using every available hour I had while my children were in school to write. But you find if you do enough of that, then you're still writing as you're driving to school to pick them up right. or you're fixing dinner or you're exercising. It's still playing around in the back of your mind. Right. Is writing easy for you? Well, I don't know how to answer that question. I will say this, I love it. Okay, I was gonna, that was my second question. I never know? feel more alive than when I am writing. I, I, when I am writing, I feel like I am fulfilling myself to the fullest, that this is, this is what I'm good at, this is what I can do. Mm -hmm. And there is a great feeling when you're in the middle of that. So in a sense it's easy because what's not easy for me is not writing, because then I feel like everything else is just my second best. Right. <laughs> writing is what I'm really good at, or that's how I feel. But I. It's 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 not an easy thing to do though. But it's an enjoyable thing. It's an me. enjoyable thing for me. Because yeah. I've heard some writers say, "I hate yes. the process. Yes. I hate writing, but I love the fact I've written." <laughs> right, that, that right, makes, right. You know, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm right. one of those people. <laughs> you know, but anyway, so so actually, so Headmaster's Darlings is the first in a series. Yes. So so tell me about the the, the other three that are coming. Well, the the it didn't start as a series. I, 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 I wrote this novel as sort of a tribute to Martin Hames, my English teacher in high school. And what I wanted to do was to show, to, to me, this teacher had a huge impact, not just on his students or a school, but he had an impact on an entire community. And I, I think he helped change a community. Mm. And I wanted to show how he did that. You know, it's often said about the South that it, it doesn't change, that it's resistant to progress. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think that's entirely true. And I wanted to take one community that I knew very well, that I had grown up in, and show how over time it had, it had changed. But I real, so I realized when I'm in the middle of writing this first novel, I can't do this in one novel. If you want to show how something has changed over time, you, you've got to go over time. You've got to start in the 80s or start back when, which is what I do, and then you've got to chart the evolution. You've got to chart some progress. Right. And so the idea of a series came when I was in the middle of that first novel. Okay. And the second book will be? It's called All the Governor's Men. And it's, it's, they're called the Mountain Brook novels, the Mountain Brook series. And, and for people who aren't familiar with Mountain Brook, it's kind of an exclusive area of Birmingham, Alabama. Correct. Right. Correct. The second one is actually um, in some ways a prequel. It's set against the backdrop of George Wallace's last run for governor of Alabama in 1982. Okay. I felt with the second one I needed to show more of the whole Alabama context, the whole state. So in this, this, the backdrop of the campaign gave me a way to do that. Great. And then the third one? The third one moves us forward in time. Okay. It's called The Harvard Bride. Okay. And then the fourth one is called The Ex-Suicide, which is a play on a Walker Percy concept, 
Walker Percy grew up in Birmingham. Okay. And uh, this, that novel is set in the house that he grew up in across from the Birmingham Country Club. Wow. And that one is set in 97. Okay. So I'm, I'm slowly but surely making my way up to the present day. And my goal is to, to keep writing the novels until I, until I get to the present day. So as you expand, how, how do you go about doing your research for that? I mean, I'm assuming even though it's fiction and you're making it up, you still have to have some level of, of reality with it. Right. So, so how, how do you go about doing that? Well, the one that needed the most research so far has been the second one, All the Governor's Men. I had to do a lot of reading and research about George Wallace right. and about just how campaigns work in general. Mm -hmm. The others, so far, I have been able to pull on my own experience and observation. But I think as I, as I go forward, I'm going to need to do more. But I, in general, I'm not a great researcher in the sense of being able to take research material and bring it to life. Right. I, I do better if I'm pulling from my own experience, my own observation. Interesting, so. interesting. Tell me about your relationship with Pat Conroy. He wrote the foreword yes. for, yes. your, for your first novel. And, uh, and then you guys have subsequently completed a, an, His an, oral biography. an oral biography. Yes. So tell me about your relationship with him. That's been one of the most special privileges of my whole life. We met in 2009 when his last novel came out, South Abroad. I was assigned by the Mobile Press Register to interview him upon that publication. And so we did a phone interview. And you can imagine how nervous I was before, <laughs> before that conversation. <laughs> and I was trying to come up with a way to tell him how much I love his his books and how much they have meant to me without sounding like a groupie. But when I got on the phone with him, the first thing he said was that he had been trying to track me down for years. He'd been trying to find me forever. And then I thought he must have the wrong person. <laughs> I think he <laughs> thinks I'm someone else. <laughs> And, and I said, are you sure that, that it's me you're thinking of? He said, no, I love your book, Milking the Moon. Wow. And my life changed right then and there. It changed. I mean, he knew about the book. He had read the book, and he was telling me he loved the book. It changed my life. He, he knew Eugene Walter. Pat lived in Rome when he wrote The Prince of Tides, and he heard about Eugene Walter everywhere he went. They crossed paths. Eugene had just gone back to Mobile when Pat went over to Rome okay. to write Prince of Tides. And he heard about Eugene everywhere he went. Oh, you just missed him. Oh, you just missed the most wonderful Southerner. Mm. So when Pat moved back to the U.S. a few years later, one of the first things on his to-do list was to go look up Eugene Walter. So he flew from Atlanta to Mobile just to meet Eugene. Wow. So, and he did that several times. And so he, he knew Eugene, and he, what he said to me on the phone was, he said, I thought Eugene was going to be lost to the world, and then your book came out. And I mean, I, I, was, I was just flabbergasted. And meanwhile, that little speech that I had been trying to formulate in my head to tell him how much I, that, that I couldn't even get it out. So that, that conversation started many more conversations. And actually our friendship was one that took place over the telephone. Mm -hmm. We had a telephone friendship. And at one point he joked to me mm -hmm. that if I'd been recording our phone conversations, I'd have a book by now. <laughs> I thought, well. <laughs> you had to find time to tell me, yeah. right? <laughs> but I will waste no further time, Pat. Uh, actually, what happened is, so he said that, and then he had a, a health scare. This is about uh, three years ago. And he nearly died in this health scare. He was in the hospital for two weeks. 
and came, came back from that, called me and said, you know, it made me realize what's on my to-do list before I die. And one of the things is I want to cooperate with a biographer. I said, well, I'm not the one to do a scholarly biography. I'm just not oriented that, that way. I said, but I'd love to do with you what I did with Eugene Walter. He said, let's do it. And we did it. And we did it mostly over the telephone, which is actually how he prefers. He's deaf mm -hmm. and he has great hearing aids. But when that phone is up right near the hearing aid, he can actually hear better than if he's in the room with you. So we did most of the recording over the phone. And it, and it, it worked. He, did, he does not need a live audience like Eugene Walter did. Right. That's what I was concerned about at first. But he doesn't need that live audience. He just, he's a great conversationalist and he loves talking on the phone. A friend of his once explained that, you know, Pat is a recluse when he's a writer. He writes all day. And then for his social life, he picks up the phone and he starts calling friends and he just talks. And that's his social life when he's writing. <laughs> In, in, in about one minute, what what's the most I guess I guess the, the most important thing you took away or you take away from your relationship with Pat? I don't know if I can do that in one minute. Sure. Um, Pat was a wonderful human being, as well as a great writer, and he was always telling me. Uh, that writers usually are no fun as friends because they're jealous, they're competitive, they don't help each other. There's no sense of camaraderie between writers. And he showed me that it's, it's important to be a human being first. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. What an absolute pleasure visiting with you. Great being here, John. I wish you the very best of Thank luck. Thank you. Catherine Clark. By the way, you can see um, Catherine's work and figure out how to get her books and whatnot at KatherineClarkBooks.com. You can see more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations, as well as on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.